Okay. Um, this is a half hour debate and the rules are going to be a little different. So um, I'm saying to the candidates and the timers, um, again, there's going to be alternating questions and by the luck of the draw, Mr. Costello gets the first question first. Ms. Wexler gets the second question first and we'll alternate. But instead of having them do answer, answer, they are also going to be allowed unlimited rebuttals. Unlimited, unlimited rebuttals. And you're, so, you're asking two lawyers for unlimited rebuttals? Yes. <laughs> I will then say to the assembled audience and candidates that if you go past so rebuttal, the audience is going to fall asleep on them. Okay, so be warned, but we're going to, because there are only the two of you, you don't have to take advantage of it, but you can if you want. Sure. You. Okay. Are these mics on? It doesn't yes. feel like it's on. Is it on? Okay. okay. Are they live? I know mine is live. Um, all right. Um, Excuse me, what are the All right, I would like to have um, up to two minutes per answer so that the need for rebuttals will be reduced. Okay, so instead of two minute, one minute, two minute, one minute, do two and two with rebuttals of a minute each, if that's okay with the timers. All right. Okay, and it's good for the candidates. All right. Um, some of the questions are multi-part, um, and some of them, um, I've got to tell you guys, there are question cards still available on the back table, and Lucy Bowden will take them to the screening panel, but this is a half-hour debate, and I think we've got more than we're going to be able to get to as it is. Um, so be warned. Um, there are no opening statements. There are the closing one minute each. Um, first question goes to Mr. Costello first, and we apologize for spelling your first name on the, on the plaque. No, no problem. It's been butchered in the past. <laughs> okay. Um, and is the law about estates the same in all states? If not, how is Connecticut different from New York or New Jersey? Now, let me say, I think we're looking for a sort of a general answer here. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm not practice. I'm not licensed to practice in New Jersey, so I can't really speak to New Jersey. I have done some probate work in New York, uh, although I'm not, I'm not licensed in New York. I can speak about uh, the Connecticut probate law. I can speak about the fact that in Connecticut uh, this past July, new rules were promulgated that dictate uh, new ideas, including uh, notice requirements, stream, streamlining of uh, pleadings, uh, requires uh, or allows probate judges more closer scrutiny of attorney billing. Um, the distinctions between the probate court systems in Connecticut and New York is significant. In New York, you have countywide probate courts. In Connecticut, you have mostly statewide probate, I'm, I'm sorry, townwide uh, town probate courts, uh, except in some towns, small towns like Westport and Weston, the, the, the courts are combined. Okay. Ms. Wexler? I can speak to that a little bit because I am admitted in New York as well as Connecticut. So in New York, it's called surrogate's court. In Connecticut, it's called probate court. What differs substantially is that probate court in Connecticut also has some concurrent family court jurisdiction. So for example, uh, in the probate courts in Connecticut not only handle estates, and in fact, in our Western Westport probate court, half of the portfolio are estates of people that have died, both with and without a will, because probate technically means, what probate is, is the transfer of property from one person to another. That's really what the word probate is. That's when you probate an estate. You get it into somebody else's name, and that's the process. That's why people have to be noticed. That's why wills have to be publicized. The other half of the portfolio in our court are people that need guardians and conservators. Now, this is something that is not done in New York surrogates court, but it is very much a part and parcel of what probate court does in Connecticut, as well as adoptions and changes of name. So there are places in which our Connecticut probate court handles matters that pertain to individual family circumstances that are not necessarily in overlap with New York. There is, a, there is significant overlap, but it's not complete overlap. And it's a very general question, but the truth is that in all 50 states, 
every single state is different. I mean, uh, Florida is very different than New Jersey, which is different than Connecticut, which is different than New York. But what I love, and one of the reasons I'm running, is because probate court is called the people's court because half, 50% of the people statewide will not even have an attorney when they come before our court. Okay, anything further? What's important to note about Ms. Wexler's last point in terms of not having an attorney before they come to the court is that I have, for over 20 years, represented people who have no attorneys, or helped people who have no attorneys, uh, abused seniors, women and children victims of domestic violence, and until and unless you've escorted a, a senior who's been financially abused or a woman who's been physically abused before a judge to steer them through our complicated and often intimidating legal system, you really don't appreciate what a self-represented person feels like when they appear before a judge. And I'll do my very best to bring my experience helping those folks who have appeared before judges without a lawyer and, and use my compassion um, that I've learned over the years. Okay, Ms. Wexler, anything Yes, I, I would just like to say that I've been practicing law since 1984. I moved to our community in 1989. I have an extensive record of pro bono representation from the first day that I that I not only hung out a shingle here in 1989, but my former affiliation was with a firm called Milbank Tweed. And frankly, it was mandatory. As part of your apprenticeship to become a lawyer, you needed to do pro bono work. So the first will that I ever witnessed and that I ever supervised was a man who was called, and it was his card, the Prince of Bohemia in Greenwich Village. He had a white beard down to the floor. His name was Maurice. And I remember that I was asked by a prominent partner at Millbank to please go to his apartment and help him through his estate completely pro bono. And that was one of my first assignments as a lawyer. And I've done this continually, as well as victims of domestic violence and all kinds of situations in which no money was ever taken. Okay, anything further? Well, I think it's important to note that most pro bono appointments are made by probate court judges and superior court judges locally. There's also a pro bono partnership out of Hartford. Uh, I have been on the pro bono appointment list for all of the local probate judges, probate courts for the last 15 years. Uh, Ms. Wexler's not. I've also been on the pro bono appointment list for the superior courts, family courts in Bridgeport and Stamford for the last 15 years. I don't think Ms. Wexler has either. I will also tell you that I've been a member of the pro bono role in Hartford for a long time. Okay, as long as my name was mentioned, let me respond. Uh, the fact is that my practice, in my practice, I have never solicited work from the court. I understand why pro bono is listed with the judges, but people know that it is common practice that in addition to getting the pro bono work from many judges, the judges are also able in some circumstances to make appointments that are not pro bono. People who know me in this community, who know the kind of work that I do, the kind of giving and volunteerism that I've given to this community, I don't think I need to justify my lack of volunteerism on behalf of our community. All right, at this point, I'm going to cut off sure, this sure. question. We, okay. could probably, we could probably do this till, till Sunday we might. afternoon. I mean, you, you did that. When you open-ended a rebuttal, you have yeah, no idea what you said. But I'm going to exercise <laughs> moderator's privilege. And you should. <laughs> we will yield. OK. Um, this question goes to Ms. Wexler first. Certainly. How important is it to have a well-run office for judge of probate? How many people are needed and how fast should applications be processed? Well, that's a really good question because it touches to a little bit of what's going on in our court. So I want to respond with respect to our court. I don't know how many of you know, but this is a special election for one year because Judge O'Grady, who has served our town so well, has become very ill. And he has unfortunately advanced Parkinson's disease. He's not able to serve our community any longer. For the last two years, Judge Caruso has done a yeoman's job of not only handling his portfolio in Fairfield, but also coming in once a week on Tuesdays to our court. And we have two and a half staff. We have Shirley and we have Karen and we have Sheila, who is a lawyer who works part time. Before that, we had Betty. I know everybody there. I've known them for 20 years on a first name basis. How important is it to have a staff? It's critical. It's critical because the staff is the interface with the community. The staff is the first person to see a grieving widow or a parent who's come in because their 19-year-old has just gotten killed on the Merritt Parkway or whatever situation or some parent has dementia or some family member has mentally ill and needs to perhaps be involuntarily committed to St. Vincent's Hospital, formerly Hallbrook. So it is a critical question. Our staff, I think, is incredibly kind 
incredibly compassionate, very competent, and it is a very, very important piece and aspect of the public face of the courts. Okay. Shirley DeLuca, who's the chief probate court, has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. Uh, Shirley DeLuca is a wealth of information. She is probably the most kind-hearted probate clerk in our area, and we're fortunate to have her. Uh, it used to be that probate courts were supported financially by the number of cases and the size of the cases each court uh, handled. Uh, that changed several years ago, and all of the money that comes into probate now goes up to the state of Connecticut, up to Hartford. And Hartford distributes monies to each court uh, based upon the number of cases it handles and, and the size of the cases. And unfortunately, the result of that, uh, you know, sending money up to Hartford has cut back on the staff. It used to be that the probate court had a, additional folks, but now there are only two and a half people. And what I would try to do is lobby with uh, Judge Knurm, who is, uh, works up in Hartford, to try to get the half-time lawyer to, to work full-time for us, because I think that th there's the volume of work there, and, um, and the people of, of Westport and Weston uh, deserve that. I will tell you that there are, I think, one and a half full-time attorneys on staff in the probate court in Norwalk, and I think two full-time lawyers on staff in the probate court in uh, Bridgeport. I think that it would be helpful to have another lawyer on staff um, in Westport and Weston. Any rebuttal? Uh, I'm going to withhold my rebuttal at the time. At this time. Okay. Anything further, Mr. Not Castell? at the moment, no. Okay. To her withholding? No. No. Anything no. further you want? Any extension of your remarks, no. I should say. No, I'm going to move on to another question. Okay. Um, this one goes to Mr. Costello first. Yikes. And it is, what do you do for individuals and... I think they mean what would you do for individuals and families who are protected by the probate court because of special needs? Well, that's a very, very important area uh, for probate consideration. The probate court is responsible for the appointment of guardians and conservators for folks that are not able to look after their own uh, uh, issues. Uh, there are two kinds of conservators. There's a conservator of the person uh, who is responsible for helping somebody make decisions, medical decisions primarily. There's a conservator of the estate who is a person who is appointed by a probate court to help manage the affairs of somebody who's demonstrated that they can't manage their affairs. Um, the role of a probate judge in appointing conservators and guardians is critically important. Um, there's no question that challenges arrive, arise in every, you know, in every family. Uh, nobody anticipates uh, a loved one becoming uh, mentally incompetent or mentally ill so that they need the, the assistance of a probate court judge. The appointment of a uh, conservator and guardian is something that should be taken very seriously. I will, I will tell you all that I have been a conservator for over a dozen people. Currently, I'm a conservator for two people. And I have participated in over 100 uh, appointments of guardian proceedings um, in the Fairfield and Westport and Weston uh, probate court. Ms. Wexler. Yes, I, I, I would like to say that uh, one of the reasons I'm running for probate judge, probably the biggest reason, is because I've spent my life, my history, my record as being an advocate for people who can't speak for themselves and the powerless and the needy among us. And this is just, it's, I won an award from the Connecticut Association of Foster and Adoptive Parents for the work I've done on behalf of those families. Uh, I happen to have a, um, a show in which, a radio show in which the people that are interns on my radio show are all the kids from Weston Prep School, which is the only school for kids with learning disabilities in our area, grades five through 12, and those are the only kids that happen to be interns with me. And I have a tremendous affinity and caring about people with special needs of all different kinds in all different walks of life. With respect to this issue, it is very, very important that the judge remember who is in front of them and why, but also uh, one of the uh, probate court reforms that is going around is a question of who should be always appointed as conservator. And I want to address that directly. Uh, the fact is that uh, judges find it very useful, and I understand why, to only appoint 
attorneys as conservators. And the reason they do that is because attorneys have licenses to protect, and they usually have a, a good background, and they are presumed to be ethical. But they charge a state sometimes a lot of money, sometimes $400 an hour. And there have been cases right here in our area of allegations in which conservators have been greedy, and they have looted older people who are sitting in nursing homes and cannot protect themselves. So one of the things that I would like to do, and that's not the law, by the way. The law does not require conservatives to be attorneys, not at all. In fact, in most cases, if there's a family member, of course the family member is going to be the likely guardian or conservator. So one of the things that I want to do is educate our community. There are many men and women in our community who for $40 an hour would be more than happy to take an elderly person to the post office, do their bookkeeping at the end of the month, uh, take care of them with kindness and compassion. And so that's something that I really want to consider as probate judge. All right, that's time, but you can extend your remarks later. Mr. Costello, any rebuttal or anything yes, further? So thankfully, as I indicated earlier, um, our state legislature promulgated new probate court rules um, in July of this year, um, allowing closer scrutiny uh, by probate judges throughout Connecticut of attorney billing. Uh, I happen to have had most of my conservator experience working on what are called CO17, on a CO17 basis. What does that mean? That means I get paid $25 an hour by the state of Connecticut for my work. I don't get paid the normal billable rate of whatever you know lawyers typically charge for conservators. And that's really, really important. But as Ms. Wexler pointed out, what's more important is that to the extent that there's a family member who can step up and has demonstrated the ability to care for a loved one, that person should, the, should be the first go-to person uh, to be a conservator. Uh, there are judges, regretfully, that, or are, situations, regretfully, where folks outside of a family, uh, an, of an immediate family, have been appointed conservator for, uh, for someone. And uh, if that can be avoided, I really think that uh, it's, it's, it, it ought to be. Ms. Wexler, any follow-up? Yeah, I, I also would like to just um, echo the fact, and uh, I have also been appointed what they call guardian ad litem, which is a special kind of fancy word that basically means you're a guardian for a person in a proceeding. Uh, I have a tremendous wealth of experience. Numerous times I have been involved with helping people who are already family members become conservators and guardians of their loved ones. Okay, anything further, Mr. No, Cassano? not at the moment. I, I, I've worked, actually had several cases where I've worked alongside a family member, uh, where I've been the conservator of the estate, which means I've been responsible for, for managing someone on incompetence financial affairs while working alongside a family member who's been the conservator of the person responsible for making medical decisions um, for their family member. And that works really, really well. Ms. Wexler, anything further? Would you like me to say me too? I think, <laughs> I, think we, I think that you're looking at two lawyers who have a lot of experience as lawyers. Okay. All right. Uh, going to go to the next question. It'll go to Ms. Wexler first. Certainly. What is involuntary conservatorship and how does it differ from a voluntary conservatorship? Okay. So the word involuntary against one's consent. It is all the difference in the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are cases in our community right now going on. And so let me explain what it is. So uh, there, as, as my opponent just said, there are two kinds of conservatorship. One is of the person and one is of the property. Very simple, one, per one person makes decisions with respect to someone's care and the other with respect to the property that someone owns. Sometimes you can be a conservator of both or either. Involuntary means that the person is having someone take care of themselves or their property against their consent, okay? And that's a big deal. And that's a big deal because when you don't have the buy-in of somebody with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia uh, or all kinds of mental conditions, you have very often a situation that lends itself to temporary appointments where everyone around the person can see that it's in the person's best interest to be committed perhaps temporarily or for 45 days to a program to dry out or detox. But that person then gets well enough to come back and say, guess what, I'm well again. So the answer is, that if you're gonna be judge of the community, and these cases do come up, even our beautiful Westport, Weston communities, they come up everywhere. You have to look at the entire person and what is in the best interest of the person, short term and long term. I was just speaking 
the other day with the staff members of Homes with Hope. And that's a marvelous organization in our community. They used to be called the Interfaith Housing Council. And the staff there wrestles with these kinds of issues every single day. And it becomes a fulcrum, it becomes a balance. And the answer is you have to examine the evidence, the medical evidence, the affidavits of the people surrounding them and decide what is in the best interests of the person. Okay, Mr. Costello. The involuntary conservatorships are the most sad. Um, the involuntary conservatorships are, uh, in, you know, they, they happen in situations where somebody who believes uh, that they can take care of their own affairs should be taking, should take care of their own affairs, and they have, you know, they absolutely reject the notion uh, that either a family member or some outside uh, person should come in and uh, manage their affairs, uh, take, you know, decide which medic medical uh, care they should, what kind of medical care they should receive, and, and manage their finances. Those are really, really tough. Uh, I was the conservator of a woman um, many years ago uh, who believed uh, it was very sad that, that animals were breaking into her condo uh, and um, tearing apart her furniture, and it was and and she absolutely rejected my appointment. Um, so I had to work with her very delicately um, and let her know that that she's still in charge, but I'm just there as an assistant to help her uh, get through some 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 awful times. I'm also currently the conservator of a woman who um, believes that uh, she wasn't abused financially. Um, and the fact is that she had some people doing work in her home who were taking her to the bank and making huge withdrawals from her bank account uh, while she signed checks. It was awful. And she, she tried to convince the court that, uh, that in fact, um, she did it voluntarily, but clearly she was being abused. Involuntary conservatorships are really tragic. Voluntary conservatorships um, are, are uh, not so difficult to, to, to uh, decide only because um, typically when somebody is, in, is voluntarily conserved, they're in a situation where it's rather clear that they're not able to make decisions for themselves because um, they're in some kind of uh, mental state where, where uh, they're not able to, to properly communicate or think. Okay, anything further, Ms. Wexler? No, I just want to say that voluntary conservatorships are often a tremendous help to to members of the family, and one of the things that a lot of people in our community don't know is that they can, is that that, that is available to them. There are people that are frail in our community, that are old, that are poor, that are losing their memory, that for whatever reason need help. And so actually you can be doing a favor for someone if you approach them and you say, how about I take this over for you? And if you can do that in a kind way, it can actually be expedited very quickly in the court. Okay, Mr. Costello, anything further? No. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask um, that this last, because this is going to be the last question before close, um, okay. that you answer um, as briefly as possible because of the time limits. Um, it's from a person who adopted three children from foster care, and it's what are your views with respect to adoption and would you make any changes in the system? Yeah, Mr. Costello, it's yours. Thank you. Um, my wife and I are so fortunate. My wife and I are the parents of two adopted children. My wife and I adopted our two children when they were infants. And they're the best things in the world. They're here today. The, the, the role of a probate judge in overseeing adoptions is really, really important. There's no question that it's, it's one of the happy things that probate judges do. There aren't a lot of happy things, positive things that probate judges do. Probate courts generally extinguish fires or address challenges that arise in families. But one of the happy things that a probate court does is oversee an adoption. And I can tell you all that having had personal experience with two of the greatest people on this earth, that I would take, um, I would take this very seriously. So I look forward to the adoption cases. I look forward to sitting with two or one parent and saying, congratulations, let me sign that decree. You know, the best of luck to you. Um, I think it's one of the greatest things um, that a probate judge does. And frankly, um, that's one of the things that's inspired me most to run. Thank you, Ms. Wexler. Yes, well, I also have a tremendously close in my world with adoption. That's why I won this award from the Connecticut Association of Foster and Adoptive Parents. My niece is adopted, my best friend adopted two biracial children over 20 years ago. And, uh, I, um, and also, right in our own court, uh, next door in Reading, I stood up as my friend uh, adopted three children out of foster care, 
and then I became their guardian, and one of those daughters came to live with us for an extended period of time already, uh, because she needed to, because that's what you do when you stand up. So um, I have a tremendous uh, affinity and closeness for adopt. I have tremendous respect, and I agree with my opponent, it is definitely the happy time in the probate court when you can make it a celebration, and you can, um, and you can do what is in the best interests of the child, uh, there are also occasionally cases in our probate court where the probate judge has to decide termination of parental rights. That's always a very tough call, but that is also part of the jurisdiction of the probate court. But adoption is a wonderful thing. Those rights need to be respected. And in court, in particular, they need to be upheld with the same kind of bonds as any other parental relationship. In terms of the changes in the adoption system, there is a issue of controversy. Connecticut is one of the states that has sealed adoption records. And there are adoptive children in Connecticut who feel that at the age of 18 or 21, those records are entitled to be unsealed. This is an issue of debate in our legislature right now. Obviously please probate judge, I will follow the law. Okay, anything further, Mr. Costello? No. Anything further? All right, thank you. That brings us by pure dumb luck to the closing statements. Okay. Um, and again, because there was a separate drawing for that, um, this one will go to Mr. Costello first. Thank you. Well, thank, I'd like to thank the League for, for inviting us here today. It's really great uh, to be here, and um, frankly, it's a lot more interesting than um, uh, or hopefully you gleaned a lot more about uh, both Attorney Wexler and myself um, than, than our palm cards would reveal. The role of the probate court is to assist families in dealing with challenges that arise uh, in, in, in families. Um, I have dedicated my entire professional life to uh, address such challenges. I have practiced law, actively practiced law. That means going to court, going to work, going to my office eight to 10 hours a day for 21 years. I have settled hundreds of estates in Westport and throughout Connecticut. I have been involved in over 100 mental hospital commitment hearings, which is critically important because Hallbrook, now St. V's, um, has between one and three commitment hearings each week. Uh, I've acted as counsel in hundreds of guardianship cases. I've been conservator, as I indicated earlier, for a dozen people. Uh, my opponent um, has no cases now pending, according to the State of Connecticut judicial website. Not true. Get your say. I, I not have, true. I must it, say not true when it's not true. You'll get your say. I have taught probate law topics on the college level as a college professor for the last 19 years. I'm a member of many probate organizations, state, local, and national, and I take pride in my knowledge of the law. From the very beginning of my legal career, I knew it was important to give back. I knew from the very beginning that it wasn't about financial remuneration. And so I teamed up with, with uh, Dorothy Friedman, um, who is uh, just a real sweetheart. And, and I started volunteering with seniors and women and children victims of domestic and financial abuse. And that work has provided to me as much or more satisfaction than, frankly, going to court or going to my office. In my practice of law and my volunteer That's experiences, this time. Thank you for your time. I look for your support. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry to go over. I'm sorry too. All right, Ms. Wexler. Thank you very much to the Western League of Women Voters, and thank you to all of you who came to show up on my behalf, my family and my friends. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about me in case you didn't get to read my palm card. I have lived in this town since 1989. I married 31 years to the gentleman sitting in the front row. I have two kids and a father and an aunt that came here and many close friends and relatives. And the reason I mention that is because probate court is all about relationships. It's all about nurturing families. Uh, my opponent is primarily a divorce lawyer. He had a billboard advertising divorce before he changed it for the probate contest. That is not what I do. That is not what I've ever done. You know me in this community. Uh, I won a lot of different awards for, for various activities that I do, and I have been a full-time lawyer since 1984, uh, coming out of NYU Law School after getting my uh, baccalaureate at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I, um, I have tremendous wealth of experience in this, and I'm running for this because this job is about having compassion as well as intellect. I have a keen intellect. I don't think anybody would dispute that. But what you need in that court is somebody with compassion who will devote their wholeness to you. I have no agenda. I have promised that I am going to diminish my practice of law and only take uh, 
existing clients in non-transactional matters, which is an occasional will and wrapping up some of the estates that I'm working on. That's it. I'm not going to be using this as a platform to get new clients. I want to be your judge. I want to be there for you. Our court is a little bit lagging because it's been two years of a visiting judge. You need somebody who's going to go in there up to their elbows and catch us up. And that's why I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you.